<laughs> All right. Okay, we're talking about we're going to talk about control for ten or fifteen minutes, and then we're going to talk about uh, yep. Then we're going to talk about uh, horizontal and vertical horizontal alignments and vertical profiles for. It's going to be reviewed for some of you guys. Some of you guys it'll be new. So we had a couple things come up on a couple different jobs today related to control for construction, and so I was I was kind of talking to Danny and. Jesse and I thought we'll just do this we'll just take the first 10 minutes of class and talk about it okay so I want you guys to understand the difference between control for mapping and control for construction because there's a big difference and when it's important and when it's not important so I'm going to walk through that okay here's what I tell people all the time what I the control I need on the ground for mapping boundary and topo is way less than Danny needs on the ground to build something as a as a general rule okay so at a mi bare minimum how many points do I need to do a topo on site two two, two. two and if we're doing it with RTN we don't even need two okay but as a general rule we like three and you should set four or five because some of them are gonna get blown out okay so what I do when I when, when somebody calls me for a boundary and topo I, I almost always, I try to always ask the engineer, would you like me to include a task for construction control? Okay? And they almost always say no, 99% of the time. Does anybody want to guess why they say no? They don't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay for it. Okay, but there's a couple, even though I know they never pay for it, I always try and put it in there, and I'll tell you why. Sometimes you ask people stuff so that when it comes up, six months or a year later you could say I asked you and you told me no so part of it is a way to manage risk and liability okay and one time out of a hundred they say yes okay so the reason I make sure that I ask the design engineer or the project owner if they want me to do construction control while I do the design is because when they tell me no and there's only three points on site so I go out we set three points we do our topo. Okay. The engineer takes our topo. They do the design. Even if this job is moving fast, how soon are they going to break ground? A year. A year, probably. Okay. What happens to point two and three? Just white. Yeah, this gets blown out. That's just how life works. Okay. So the contractor shows up on the job to start work. And the very first thing he needs is layout so he can grow and he sees my name on the topo and the phone rings and what does he say Can I, get some control? I need control lay out this site and so i send him over the plans and he goes out to find my control and how many does he find one can you lay out a site with one point no so the contractor tells the project owner i can't lay the site out your surveyor doesn't have enough control and then the project owner calls me and they're all been out of shape because they just paid 20 grand for a survey and they said, hey, my contractor can't lay the site out. Where's your control? And what do I tell them? We didn't lay out construction control. Please refer to optional task five in my scope of services that you decided you didn't want because it was too much money. And I tell them I would be happy to provide enough control for your contractor to lay this site out. Please send me a email and authorize Optional task five with the dollar amount stated below. Okay, now two things happen at that point. I either get authorized to do the task or call for a lawyer. <laughs> the contractor figures out figures out how to do it. Now usually by that point the contractor has their own surveyor. Okay, so the one of the key takeaways there is when I do a boundary and topo, have I set enough control for construction? No. 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 Not only that. The control I set doesn't need to be to the same level of accuracy that Danny needs to build stuff. So I don't typically level through my control on a topo. We always, or should always, almost always, level through control when we're doing finished grade construction layout. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about when this is important and when it's not important. So if we're building a 50 by 50 foot cold storage, cold vegetable storage shed in the middle 
of a five acre field and I come out here and set my control points okay even if these aren't very accurate it doesn't matter and I'll tell you why Danny is going to come out here to set his construction control and he's going to set up on two and he's going to backside one and he's going to set his construction control right here and these construction control points are going to be very tight horizontally and vertically within themselves and their values are going to be calculated off of two. Now, if you come in and run in an independent survey off of one of three, are you going to get the same values? No. No, you're not going to get there. You're going to be kicking around a couple tenths, or maybe even a half a foot. It doesn't matter, because everything that's getting built here on this shed is relative to what? Itself. This set of points, which is relative to number two, and nobody cares that it doesn't fit number three. Does that make sense? What they're trying to do here is they're trying to get they have, they, when in, in uh, ancient times, like in ancient Rome, when they used to build buildings, they had something called the cornerstone that they would set. It's this big stone that went at the corner. Everything got laid off the cornerstone, right? So in essence, that's what Danny's doing. He's picking one point, point A, and everything gets laid off of A, okay? And it's all tied to A. And on a situation like this, do we care if this moves around on the field a tenth or two? No. No. No, it doesn't matter. Okay, so in this scenario, my topo control can be a little sloppy. Okay? Because it doesn't matter. Okay? Now, sometimes it matters. We learned that today, didn't we? Zero lot line. Okay, so zero lot line's one. I'm gonna give you another example. Let's just say we're building the same fifty foot by fifty foot shed. Okay? And this is on a topo still? This is on a topo. We're building a 50 by 50 foot shed, but there's an existing food processing warehouse right here. And the 50 by 50 foot shed needs to go through, but needs to go in right here. And this has got to be wide enough to drive a truck through, and there's going to be conveyor belts that bridge across 20 feet in the air. Okay, and these conveyor belts got to line up with these internal columns in the food processing warehouse. This is a real deal. This could really happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if we topo the existing structure off of three and Danny holds his two, comes in and does his cons construction control off of two, what problem are we going to have? Slop. It's not going to fit. We're going to have the, we're gonna have the tenth or two again, guys. So what mistake did Danny make? He didn't tie it to one. He came, in, he came off of two instead of three. He should have held three. Where do we topo the building? I three. Okay, so what the existing building is what I call a design constraint. It's a constraint on the existing design. Okay, those column lines control. So what really controls the location of the shed? Is it control point three? No, it's the is existing it ex building. It's the existing building. Now, when, if this is the scenario, can you half-ass your shots to the column lines on the existing building when you do the topo? No. So if that building is a design constraint, what do I have to know when I do the topo? I, That's what like I have to know down. that. I have to know that. Okay, now I'll give you another, we'll make this even a, a little more complicated. Let's say there's a floor drain in this new shed that's got to come over here and dump in an existing storm drain test basin. Now, not only is the horizontal, if not only is it there a horizontal design constraint, there's a, there's a vertical design constraint and they're not even in the same place. So let's just say, I'm going to make this worse. Let's say the storm drain we got we to gotta tap into is down here. Which point did we shoot that from? One. One. No. Oh, yeah, one. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah one. That's where we did. We shot it from one. Where did we shoot the building from? Three. three. Now the relationship between one and three becomes really important. And so when I do the design topo, what do I have to do between one and three? It's got a level on. i got to run a level on. between it, and i got to make sure that's really tight. Now here's the challenge for us as a, as a survey team. How often do you think the design engineer communicates to me all the design constraints? Not very. Yeah. It's, it's, so part of what you part of being a good surveyor when you get the phone call to do a design topo and boundary is to ask what? 
What is it used for? What are we doing and what are your design constraints? Okay, and in urban projects, this is worse. Because what do you have on each side of your site? Other buildings. Or, or surveyors. What else could be a constraint? Property lines. Yes, or what's almost always a constraint in an urban? Easements. No. No. Something physical. Fences? No. Concrete. Curb and gutter. Wow. If you're tying into a street conform or your drainage, right, you got to know where that's at. Okay. Anytime you have a site that's going to tie into hardscape, existing hardscape, that's what we call a conform line. And you got to really think about your conform lines. Okay. So, a lot of times it doesn't matter. Danny picks one point and he rolls. And he lays out the construction control. But if there are elements of the site that are going to constrain the design, existing features, then you got to really think about that. And, I, and, and that's why it makes sense to have the same surveyor that does your design survey do you what? So, construction sticking. How often does that happen? Never. 20%. So you got a different surveyor doing the construction layout, right? And you got to remember, by the time he gets here, what's happened to point, point two and three? No. So he's going to run everything in from one, and what's going to happen when he gets over here? It's going to be off. Okay. So I'll just give you an example. I can topo two miles of road from four or five points. Especially if we're doing it, if we're doing it R to K, okay. If I was going to do construction control on a job like that, I'd set a control point every thousand feet, and we'd run levels. It's just there's a huge difference between what you need for construction and what you need for topo and after. Usually, Does that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's talk about horizontal alignments and vertical profiles. Try not to mix those two up. They're different. It's not horizontal profile and vertical alignment. It's horizontal alignment and vertical pro pro vertical profile. Okay, so they are typically used for linear features, roads, levees, pipelines, railroads. Okay, so a horizontal alignment is made up generally of segments and curves. Horizontal curves. We'll do a different class and we'll teach you all about horizontal curves. Okay, so this is a segment. This is a curve. Okay, curves generally have, these are called tangents. I'll just get you familiar with some of the tech terminology. These are tangents, this is the PI, point of intersection. Okay. Alignments are, are Managed with stationing. You guys have all seen stationing. So you come down here, this is 10 plus a pair. Okay? That's just another way to write 1,000. Okay? Sometimes you'll hear surveyors say 10 plus balls. Okay? So if this is 200 feet long, what's my station here? Oh, 12 plus 00. 12 plus zero, zero. Okay, let's say we got a uh, 300 foot long or 100 foot long curve, so that's going to be 13 plus 00. zero. Okay, um, that looks about like 300 feet, so we'll call that 16 plus 00. zero. Okay, Civil 3D has a way to label, automatically label all that. Those stations we'll teach you guys at some point. Now, Let's say we're going in, we got some features that we're, let's say we're, uh, we got a railroad track crossing right here. Okay, let's say it's a it's an elevated railroad track, so there's a trestle here with some abutments, some bridge abutments. What engineers will do on their plans is they'll go in and they'll label this with a station and what we call an offset. So what station does that look like, guys? About 13, 14. About 14 maybe. 13 plus 25 maybe? Yeah, it's super close to 13. I guess that's 15. No, was that 13, 14? Yeah, you guys are right. Let's call it, a, we'll call it 14, 10. Okay, 14 plus 10. Okay, then you give an offset left or right. So my left or right? Right. 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 
headed up station on to the right. So let's say it's 50 feet right. So I want you guys to understand stationing is a coordinate system. It's a horizontal coordinate system. You can map just about any point you need to with the station and an offset if you have an alignment. And that's what you see on plans. They don't give you northings and eastings. If you're doing corridor work, you don't get northings. If you, in, a, in a perfect world, you get a northing and easting on everything you need to stake. You don't get northings and eastings. Danny, what do you get? Alignments. And stations and offsets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this only works if you have bearings and distances on your segments, curve info on your curves, and you need at least what on two points? Coordinates. Coordinates, north and east. So the very first thing I do when I get a set of plans, Like if I'm doing a transportation project, I find the control sheet and I look. Do I have northings and eastings on two of my points on my alignment? Do I have the bearings and distances? Do I have the station? You only need one all right. The second just a check. Well, you need alignment. Right, but if you have coordinates on the starting point, you have all that info. Oh, yeah, if you got bearings and distances, you're right, Mike. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you just you need that to a check. That's right. Okay? So that's how stationing works. Now, you can go, the once you have, once you have this, you can go back and forth. You can convert northing and easting to station offset or station offset to northing and easting. Okay? Now, usually there's a second thing called a profile. Okay? And that's where you get your Z's. So you have a profile. Okay, and the profile looks something like this. I'm gonna have a really lame looking vertical curve. Okay, so this is uh, 3%, then they'll give you your curve, vertical curve. Vertical curve is just an upside down parabola. And they'll usually give you the length here. And we got minus 5%. They'll give you, we got another vertical curve here. They'll give you a length. Okay, and then we're at plus 4%. Okay, and these all get state. These all get stations. So they'll tell you, station ten plus a pair. Station twelve plus a pair. Twelve, thirteen, ten. Uh, fourteen, no, fifteen, ten. Okay. And usually you get some elevations here, so they'll give you some elevations at key points. Okay. Profiles associated with an alignment. What gives you the horizontal? The alignment. the alignment. What gives you the Z's, the elevations, the profile? You need them both. If you want to know the northing easting elevation of this exact crossing point, you got to use both. You got to use the profile and the alignment. Okay. All right. There's something else I was going to say. Okay. So I'm going to teach you one more thing. On a road project or a levee project or could be a canal project, you don't usually see this on pipe projects, but on a road project, this is a two-lane county road. They're going to give you what they call typical sections. Okay, so here's a really simple typical section. What does this mean? Ignore my one. What's that mean? Two to one grid. This is a two to one slope on the shoulder. Two to one slope on the shoulder. Do you guys know what two to one is? Two over one. Good, cool. good. Thank you, Logan. No, I know what two over one is, but I don't know. Yes, like rise over one. Out of two down feet down. out, one foot down is oh, what that okay. means. Gotcha. Okay. This is percent. This is what they call this point right here. Yep. But oh, crown. Crown. Oh, Sometimes your center line is not your crown. I don't Usually, know. but not always. Yep. Okay. So here's what you have to do now. If you want, if the contractor calls, this is EP, and he says, Danny, I want edge of pavement rough grade stakes for the whole alignment so I can start my rough grade. Are those are those northings and eastings and elevations shown on the plans? No. No. 
This is engineers being lazy. Okay? So what does Danny have to do to count those points? We got to go stake them in the field. You take your typical section and you sweep it through your alignment. And you figure out where, and you got to remember, it's not only sweeping horizontally, it's also sweeping what? Vertically. Up and down on the profile, right? And you rebuild this design in three dimensions. Now, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can do it in AutoCAD. You can also do it in Excel. And we're going to teach you guys, we'll teach you how to do it, okay? But here's what a lot of people don't realize. With this automated machine control crap that they got now, this, the surveyor is not on the construction side as much. And that causes problems because before a piece of wood gets laid in the ground, what does that surveyor do with the engineer's plans? He completely builds a 3D model of that set of plans. And guess what? Every set of plans you get, when you go to build a 3D model, what do you find? There's problems and busts. Now, as more engineers design in 3D, that will happen less frequently. What percentage of engineers are designing in true 3D, do you think, right now in the United States? Very little. Uh, it might be more than five. It might be 20. Okay. So to some extent, this is stupid, and I'll tell you why. Because who has, who should have all these northings and eastings and elevations? The engineers. We get paid to redo it. That's just the way the world works right now. Okay. In an ideal world, the engineer would send the surveyor a 3D model or 3D brake lines and we would just drop points. Okay? Why do engineers not like to do that? Because there's errors. They, don't want to take the they have a liability at that point. If we have to rebuild the 3D model from the plans and we screw something up, who's wrong? Who's liable? We are. We are. So engineers don't like to give people 3D models. It's extra liability for them. And they will tell you, you cannot stake off the CAD drawings. You have to stake off the approved plans. I've even had an engineer tell me, I RFI'd him on a transportation project, and said, you got problems with your plans. They said, stake out the CAD file. I staked out the CAD file. There was a huge bust, because the structural and the civil weren't talking. And then we had this big meeting, and my boss was there, and the other guy's boss was there, and the construction manager was there, and the city was there. And you know what that engineer looked across the table and said to me? It's your fault. You should have staked out the CAD drawings. Now, thank God I had that email. Shouldn't have? Shouldn't have. Yeah. He told me to stick off the CAD file when he didn't want to deal with my RFI. And then when there was a problem in the CAD file, because... So here's where you most frequently have problems on a design is where two disciplines overlap or touch. So where the structural touched the civil, they didn't talk. The civil had the structural... The civil didn't have the fill embankment in the right spot and the, the footing for the bridge abutment that the structural design was like three feet up in the air. It was exposed. Okay, because they didn't talk. Okay, so that's what happens. Food's here? Okay, we're almost done. All right, any questions? Basic, uh, this is kind of overview. We're gonna we're gonna actually gonna sit down with a plan sheet next week and we're gonna do some pipe calcs. Okay, with a with a profile. We're gonna look at a profile and an alignment. We're gonna do the calcs. Okay, any questions on what we covered? Jim, you think this will help you? Yeah, A little bit? Okay. All right. So let's take five minutes and talk about Trader. Talk about what I messed up in Embarcadero and the lessons we learned. And then we'll go eat. So I'm gonna try and keep this short. But if I'm not working here on Monday, you guys will know why. Did you do a job with Jim? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> four four blocks. Downtown San Francisco. Each block worth more money than I will make in my life. It's probably a half a billion dollars. Yeah, all the people in this room. Yeah. It's probably half a billion dollars for just one block. Okay. Yeah. Just the land. Just for the building. So, Mike, how many maps we got down here of these four blocks? Basically Zero. There's no maps. Wait, Wait, the sensors play. Hey. There's no maps. There's no maps. We have one old, old map that gives us the road right away whips. Which there's no maps. And it's downtown SF, so there's like no monuments, and there's maybe a couple. So this has been surveyed for 200 years, and nobody has ever followed the law filed. Guess what I get to do? Joy. Fuck. I get to file. Okay. So, <laughs> Mike, how many centerline monuments we got down here? None. There's no monuments in this whole four blocks. Damn. There's nothing. So I had to split curves. So here's what we did. We went out and surveyed the curves. Okay. 
and we came up with center lines. We split the curves, and they, they fit within about a foot. Is that good for curves? Uh, it's not good? wonderful, but considering where I'm at and how old everything is, okay, this doesn't have a so we have. This is a plaza on the waterfront. We have no choice but to use it. Okay. So we took we calculated these red lines from our curves, and then we did the offsets, the record offsets from the right away, old right away map we had, and we came up with these block boundaries, and I sent them to the, the architect was screaming at me, so we sent them. Okay? And I said, next week I'll get the deeds and we'll make we'll see how the deeds fit, but we should be close. It should be within a foot. Okay? And the next week I didn't do it. And the next week after that I didn't do it. And the next week after that I didn't do it. And Mike, how long has it been? January? Yeah, it's been five months. And Mike, what did you and I finally do this week? We got out and started mapping all the deeds. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle. These blocks are different pieces. You put them together. And when we start mapping them now, this is important. On one block, one of these blocks and only one, the street was narrower. But this was a city park. These are all private. So I looked at that and I said, yeah, that's a little funky. I said, the city must have come in here and expanded the park. Right? Mike, is that what happened? No. They didn't expand the park. I got it backwards. What did they do on these other three blocks, Mike? They took 10 feet. But when I did my center line, did I use the line down here? So this is a 10-foot strip that the city took. When I placed my center lines, which curbs did I use? The ones that the city used. The curbs up here now, the city widened the street. So where are these red lines? They're off by 10 feet. They're off by 10 feet, which means where is this line? Off by 10 feet. Off by 10 feet. Now, here's how we could have caught this, even without looking at the deeds. But as soon as you look at the deed, you know. Because our line, right, this purple line that we have is 285. And guess what the deed says? 275. 275. Because you're 10 feet long. That's what Mike saw. Mike came to me a couple days ago and was like, hey, this doesn't match. I was like, yeah, you're right. Now, here's here's how we could have caught it. We just missed it. That old right away map had some distances on these center lines. And if we'd have looked, we'd have realized we were 10 feet too long. Okay, now let me tell you. Now, thankfully, we weren't building skyscrapers here. By the way, I wouldn't have shipped this without checking the deeds if we'd have been building skyscrapers. I'd make the client wait. Okay, we're just doing sidewalk improvements. So nobody's gonna execute me, but I might lose my job. So let me tell you why I might lose my job. The, the engineer and the architect used this purple line to decide where to put improvements in or out of the city right away. Can you put whatever you want in the city right away? Mm -hmm. No. So now the problem is, guess where the real line is? 10 feet in. 10 feet in. So here's where I'm going to get burned. If the design team put something that can't go in the right of way in that area that I told them was private, 10 feet, and they got to move it, we're paying for it. Uh, we're going to pay for it. Now, is it 10 or is it 5? It's 10. It's 10. Okay, so let's all learn from my mistakes. This is the, like this is going to get, it is going to get bad probably today because I'm sending an email today. So what did we learn from landing on this? Double check your shit. Okay, yeah. In a timely fashion. Double check in a timely fashion. Read the deed. Read the deed. All of those things. Should I have waited to June to check this? No. Guess what? I got busy and what did I do? Slipped it off. I put it off, I put it off. I didn't forget about it, but I put it off and put it off, put it way too long. Because if I had checked it the next week. Could have changed it before they designed everything. Yeah. And just pissed people off. So there you go, there's my story. And I knew, like, this is literally a half a billion dollars of property, folks. And I dorked it up. So here, here's the other, now, so there's one good thing that I did here. When Mike came and told me about this problem, how long did I wait to tell Will, Mike? Not long at all. I told him that day. So if you guys ever make a mistake like this, what do I want you to do? Tell you. Listen, to delaying and trying to, to trying to cover this up, it's not going to happen. Only going to make things worse. And guess what I'm telling the architect and the engineer? 
you screwed up. Today, I'm telling them today. I just found out yesterday. Okay, because a lot like, do I want to wait for this to go to construction? Nope. No. Nope. That's going to be super expensive. That's a lot of cement. So don't do this. Class dismissed. Go eat your sandwiches. So they haven't built anything yet, right? Not yet. No. So it's just it'd be redesigned. Yeah, I'm going to be on the. We'll be on the hook for redesign, whatever that is. 